With content marketing, it's not like a, I, I like to say that it's a slow burn. So it's not like you publish one article and boom, you've made it, you know? It is a series of building upon content that's been published. Hello and welcome to the Kelly Limber podcast. I'm your host, business mentor, personal brand and style expert on a personal mission to inspire a minimum of five people daily to take action, just to do something different and show up as the best person that they aspire to be. And if you're one of my five a day, then I really want to hear from you. There's two places that you can do that. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Tell us what inspired you the most maybe about this podcast or come and tell me on Instagram, Kelly Lundberg Official. Leave me a DM, a reply back. I just love hearing from you. So in today's episode, I catch up with Monica Mahuta, the founder and CEO of The Gaggler. Um, She's a real passionate entrepreneur and is always looking for ways to create something that's got a real positive impact. And this passion has led her to start up businesses in education and more recently in online publishing. We talked about the advantages of starting a business as a franchise owner versus her experience um, as being a startup entrepreneur and the pros and cons for both. So if maybe this is something you're considering, then this is definitely worth tuning in for. She also shares her insights into what content marketing can do for your brand, that other modes of advertising can, plus influencer marketing and brand partnerships and the benefits towards a balanced approach with influencer marketing. So here's the episode. Welcome to the show, Monica. It is great to have you here. Thank you, Kelly. I'm so glad to be here. It's your first podcast. First podcast interview. How, how, is, how are you feeling? Yeah, it is my first podcast interview. I'm a little nervous, but sort of in an excited way. So let's see. <laughs> Good stuff. So Monica, actually, for those that are just tuning in, Monica reached out to me a couple of years ago when she started her latest business, which we're going to get into. And it was much more when I was, it was styling related. And I remember saying at the time, I'm in the process of selling my agency. And so I always knew of your business. And then we've reconnected again through Tish Tash. And I think it's kind of fair to say, you know, Dubai's been your home for a really long time. Why don't you give everyone a bit of a backstory as to you and then we can get into to your business? Sure, of course. So my backstory starts way back. Um, I actually grew up here in Dubai, so I'm a quintessential Dubai kid. Do I then left after... Do they have a name, like the du- Dubai kids, like a... Uh... Yeah, well, I think yeah, I think we're kind of known as the Dubai kids, right? Um, oh, exactly. It's sort of like a stereotype. <laughs> Don't know if we live up to it, but um, but yeah. So I, I graduated from high school and moved to the states. Uh, went to college there and then grad school and worked there for many years. And I only recently, well, not not so recent now, but eleven years ago, came back with my own family, my husband and my daughter. And I came back to set up a business in education. I was very passionate about um, early years education, and I brought with me a uh, franchise concept from New York called Kidville. And I ran that from 2009 till 2018 when I exited the business. Wow. And um, yeah, and then that's when I sort of transitioned into the next phase, which is the gaggler. And uh, yeah, uh, so that's sort of the, the the quick story. So you started off, so your first kind of before I guess into business was franchising. Right. Yeah. So what made you go down that route? So I think it had a lot to do with um, just what was happening in my life at that time. I mean, I just, uh, you know, I had a 10 month old uh, infant and I wanted to do something that was related to education because I've always been kind of interested. I mean, I've been very blessed to be able to be educated, go to college and grad school. And I think it certainly set me up for for where I am now in life. And so I kind of wanted to be part of that environment. Mm -hmm. And so I actually used to go to Kidville. I used to take my daughter Anaya to Kidville for her classes. And it was fun. It was a sort of fun way of bonding with her and making friends and socialization. And when we made the decision to move to Dubai, I thought, you know, wow, this could be pretty, you know, pretty perfect to bring here. And it's something different. And they were just about launching their international franchise program. So I took advantage of that. And that was one of the reasons, you know, I, I brought that over with me. And um, I mean, I believed in the in the brand. I myself had used it, and I really wanted to share that with um, with the families in Dubai. So, how have you found the difference between then you kind of 
done the franchising and now you've set up from scratch what, what are, you know you've done your own thing what is the sort of pros cons maybe give us a couple of pros yeah. or things that you've learned through franchise just to give people the, the perspective sure of course I mean look with the franchise business a lot of the thinking and the trial and error is taken out um, of the picture so with a franchise concept, you know, you, you, you actually get a, um, a blueprint of sorts, you know, um, you get to get, get to open and uh, into market faster. You know, you get training and manuals and a whole system. So in some respects, franchised um, concepts have shown to have a higher success rate. There's also, of course, a certain brand recognition that's there, right? Um, I mean, you need to attain a certain brand recognition to be able to then move into the franchising world. So that in itself gives credibility, right? So you could be, you know, I was a first time entrepreneur. This was my first ever, you know, initiative that I sort of invested in and, 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 you know, launched by myself. And so therefore sort of partnering with a franchisor that had been there, done that really helped me in terms of minimizing mistakes and really making sure that I put my best foot forward when launching here. Yeah. But there are of course cons, as you said, you know, everything, there's no such, such thing as a free lunch. So the fees that you have to pay for, you know, in order to be, to get the license to the franchise license can be high. It, not everyone can afford it. And also you are somewhat, you are restricted, right? So you're, you're buying into a system. So you've got to do things the way they do it, right? So with the courses, they had to be a certain way, the technology as well, you're kind of limited with maybe, you know, how much you can change the technology to adapt to kind of what you're doing here. So there is a little bit of a give and take. Mm -hmm. But when I compare that to starting from scratch, definitely, yes, it, it, you know, starting from scratch is a lot harder and, um, and you do make mistakes, but I think, and there is obviously as a con, I guess the risk of, of, of failing is, 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 is very real, um, because you're brand new to this, you're doing this for the first time and, you know, you could tap into networks and whatnot and learn. You know, but again, you're doing that learning on your own. So it's sort of slower as well. Mm -hmm. But I will say though, in terms of the advantages, um, what I found just very fulfilling is, you know, just all the innovation and the creativity that you are surrounded with, as well as the, the, the professional freedom, you know, and the ability to grow within that. It, it is certainly a, a high that is really hard to, I think, replicate um, otherwise, you know. All oh, that roller coaster journey of entrepreneurship. The highs are high. They really are. But the lows suck. <laughs> they sure do. They sure do. So give the audience a little bit of a, a sort of background as to the business that you're doing now. And then I want to ask what is some of the mistakes, seeing as we were talking about mistakes that you made in the beginning. <laughs> and you won't be able to see, but um, we're actually... Those that are listening, we're, we're watching, we're actually looking at each other. So I can see when you laugh. So I know that there's quite a few things that you're thinking. <laughs> there's a few mistakes. So, so give us a little bit of a backstory so people know what we're talking about. Sure. So I launched the Gaggler in um, 2019. What we are is a uh, Dubai-based digital lifestyle platform specifically for women that are living in the UAE and, um, and now the broader GCC. And our aim is to, you know, provide a, a resource, if you will, by way of a website and our social channels and then our private communities on Facebook to help women uh, make more conscious decisions about their choices, whether it's, you know, about beauty or wellness or fashion or other lifestyle, you know, areas. And we do this through our, you know, through our content. So we, we will um, speak to experts and provide um, and, and write up articles that help women, you know, learn about certain medical ailments, like we were talking about endometriosis earlier, you know, so we get experts to talk about that. We get experts to talk about the latest trends in wellness. Uh, we also produce our own uh, meditation kits to kind of help women find an easy way to incorporate mindfulness in their lives. And then from a business perspective, you know, we work with select brands to really bring the best of what's out there. And, and, you know, um, tell their stories so that, you know, consumers can more easily and readily, you know, kind of identify with the brands that work for them and the ones that maybe aren't for them. So it's, it's really like we work on both sides, um, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, sorry, I forgot your, your, your other question you had asked me. The mistakes that you made when you started. Oh, the mistakes. Oh, oh my goodness. We might, a, we, might, we might need a separate podcast for that one. No, but I think... Um, I mean, look, every entrepreneur makes mistakes. I think, um, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not a, um, 
you know, an expert on digital business. This is my first digital business. So I made errors in that, I think, in terms of what I needed um, in the website that we launched with. So, for example, you know, the way we designed the website two years ago, if I had known what I know now, it would have been very different. And in fact, I'm in the process of um, launching a new website, and I'm really excited that it's going to go live at the end of the month. So you, you learn certain things like that, and they can be some of them can be very expensive mistakes. But uh, but I think that's all in the you know it, it's you've got to make some mistakes and you've got to fail to be able to learn and then you know jump jump out of that you know to success. So funny you say that about the the website. The, exactly the same happened for me when I first started my styling business oh, nearly two decades ago. But I redid it six months later because often what you start doing is not what you obviously you're constantly evolving. But what you think goes to market and how people respond to it is really, really, really different. And my, my first iteration of my website had gift experiences on it, not just for styling, but had um, all sorts of other of, um, things you could do in Dubai because I really saw a kind of tourist angle, you know, 18, mm-hmm. 19 years ago. That didn't take off at all for me. And then I ended up working directly with women and men in Dubai and purely styling. And I had to change the website to reflect that. Yeah. And I think, I think the same sort of similar happened to me. Um, so I don't know whether it was just the excitement of like launching a website, you kind of want to throw everything in there. Right. So, I mean, we did the same thing. So I had, you know, I had, um, a category, I had, I was targeting women and men across style, beauty, you know, beauty, travel, well-being, you know, just, it was such a broad kind of like a really scary animal, if you will. And, um, and I had to quickly, like within about nine months, I had to tailor that down to just be woman. And then from that point forward, then I have now had to kind of even tailor it down more. So the new website that'll launch at the end of the month will be a very, very focused website and much more, I guess, from a user interface perspective, navigable so that it's, it is that honed down version of, of really what the business is about. But you're right. It is, it is an you know, evolution. So if I was to just ask that, because something, you know, when I'm mentoring clients, they're often very scared to go hone down their niche. You know, it's like, oh, I can serve everyone. I can help everyone. Much in the case of how I started and, and how you started, I can help men and women. We can target both of them. And now you've, you've, uh, you've got it down to a real focus a clientele or describe that, that niche to you or describe me like what age are they or what do they, like what, what is that person like? Just to give people that sort of idea on how, I don't know how small, but how specific they could maybe go. So I get, so, so if I describe maybe like the, the gaggler girl, is it? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So our gaggler girl is aged from 25 to 50. She is curious. She could be a stay-at-home mom. She could be a working professional and have, you know, adequate income, but she kind of wants to maximize on life a little bit more. You know, she really wants to kind of push the, the, the boundaries of what she can achieve and experience in life. Uh, she is based in the UAE, but we're also sort of seeing women, the gaggler girl showing up in Saudi Arabia and other markets in the GCC. But very much sort of, you know, a woman that's living here, experiencing life in the Middle East, in the region, and, um, you know, and, and wants to, wants more, uh, is so curious that she wants as much as she can get out of life. And a woman that is secure enough uh, with who she is, but wants to tap into this element of being, being her kind of beautiful, not being beautiful as, say, society dictates or the media dictates, but really you know, looking within and being beautiful from the inside out. Love it. Where did the name come from, by the way? <laughs> so uh, we spent some time as, you know, my team and I spent some time brainstorming. And um, the name Gaggler actually is, um, it sort of stemmed from gaggle, like a gaggle of geese, right? So when we started, we wanted to, and, and we, we, we still do this today, but, you know, we wanted a gaggle of voices, right? Because a woman is not just one type, right? There's so many personalities, so many shapes, so many colors, if you will. So we wanted, to, we wanted to be able to cater to a gaggle of women, but we also wanted to have a gaggle of, you know, writers that could, you know, write to each of those types of women. And so, so that's where the, 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 the main part of the name stemmed mm-hmm. from. And then we kind of wanted to be a little bit um, cheeky and have some fun with it, you know, and um, 
uh, and so the gaggler came from like, you know, trying to be wanting to be the Gazette or the Herald, you know, so kind of tongue in cheek sort of. Very good. And we, you touched on there actually about having the, the gaggle of, of writers. So do you have external writers that can write for you? How does that work? And let's kind of go into the sort of aspect of, you know, that content marketing, because that is just content, content, content. It's all people mm. are talking about when you're in business just now, when you are in the business of creating content for people to read and consume. So I guess maybe my first question is maybe talk a little bit about that, but also can other people contribute to the Gagler? How do you get your experts? Yeah, so we do have a team. Uh, you know, I have an editor, uh, Lucy Wildman, um, who's with me, and we do have internal, like in-house writers as well. And for external writers, really, I mean, you know, we like to support, um, you know, women that are wanting to share their voice and um, and be be heard. And so we do, I mean, if it's an expert or, you know, somebody with like very specialized knowledge that would cater to the women that we know come to our website on a monthly basis and our social channels, then we would certainly work with them. And the service we provide is, you know, to help them kind of polish up that piece because, you know, people may have expertise, but they may not have the, or maybe confident enough, you know, to be able to write an editorial feature. So we kind of provide that service as well. But yeah, I mean, it's really a, case by case basis to be honest and when there's a match you know we we love collaborating with um with people who have something to say and and from a personal brand and a business perspective you know it's great to align yourself with people that also have the the platform so you have the platform but being able to connect with people who are an expert in what they do and it's kind of like a bit of a a win win oh absolutely Abs- it certainly is a win win because we learn so much you know every time we we feature you know an expert's um content I mean, we learn so much. They know what they know. And our knowledge is, um, you know, we know how to create the content that, um, you know, our audience finds engaging. What kind, you know, like content marketing on a whole, what can it do for your brand that maybe other modes of advertising can't? What would you say in your opinion? Um, so there, there are a few things. I think with um, content marketing, you can certainly educate your audience in a way that other types of advertising can't. Um, so when you use content marketing in a, in a storytelling format, and that's what we primarily focus on, you know, you can really achieve a lot of traction and get your, your audience's attention that like, say you do, I don't know, you know, you put up, you, you do paid advertising, you know, it's just, it doesn't work that way. You know, your, your, your audience is learning that you have something to sell, but they're not really learning about your brand story. They're not learning about say the people behind the brand, you know, mm-hmm. They're not hearing about what the product's efficacy or key features are, you know. And and so when we apply our lens, which is to provide educational, um, informational, and inspirational um, content, that comes out much more um, stronger, I'd say. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say, I think, is also you're able to develop uh, lasting connections with your audience. So with content marketing, it's not like a I like to say that it's a slow burn. So it's not like you publish one article and boom, you've made it, you know? It is a series of building upon content that's been published, you know? So it does take time, but it does create lasting connections that your audience will recall, you know, when they need something in the future. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the digital footprint that um, adds to people's credibility. And I think there's Something I always try and reiterate, especially to those just starting out, is not everyone is ready to buy your product or service today. Yeah. And you've really got to remember that, that it is that nurture, 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 nurture. Oh, hey, I'm going to buy it. And and it is that. Don't be naive to think, which I was the day that I launched my business. I remember it was the 21st of September, 2005. And I was like, hey, I've launched the business to the world. In my yeah, head. here they come, right? Here they come. <laughs> Honestly, when I go looking at my phone going, no one's called me. Like, why is no one called me? My business is live. My website is live. And yeah. not everyone is ready right now. And I guess that's what you're offering. Yes, exactly. They're not ready right now. And, and, and they, they, they don't know if they need to be ready. You know, like, so they don't have any information on you. They don't know who you are. They don't know what you stand for. And one of the other things I think is with content marketing, it also creates trust. So for example, when you are publishing content about a brand or their product or their service in an educational way, in an advisory way, and you're providing useful tips or solutions, you know, freely, like there's no sales pitch there, right? 
the level of trust that is built, you know, with the, you know, the reader um, or the customer, it is so immense. And you really nothing, I, no other advertising can, I think, buy that. At least that's what I'm, I've seen. And, you know, I guess the key is, of course, you know, there's always a right and wrong way, way to do things, but either working with a content strategist or a publisher that specializes in this can really help make sure, you know, you kind of get the right footing and then can create those positive associations, you know, in your, in your customers' minds or the other, or the customers you're trying to attract, you know, if you're a new business. Mm, There's so many correlations there with, you know, building your personal brand, the storytelling, connecting with your audience. Uh, nurturing your audience um, and being seen as the experts are all pillars that help build your credibility and and establish why people would want to work with you. You you do uh, sort of quite a few brand partnerships and sort of, if I touch on this word, influencer marketing, (laughs) which people love or they loathe in in the word influencer. Um, What are the benefits towards kind of influencer marketing maybe like how you've used it how it works and your your experience well so like so so you know we did use a a fair bit of influencer um we did a fair bit of influencer marketing in our early days i mean we were new like we were the new kid on the block right and so with everything you need to associate with you know influencers that that have the same values or you know that um kind of there's some alignment there has to be some alignment right and we did it because we were new. We wanted to be, you know, we wanted people to get to know us better. And so we worked with micro influencers that kind of, there was some alignment, there was some synergies in terms of the messaging and kind of you know, their focus on helping women in, you know, whatever way it might be. And so we've used that. And I, I think it, it worked really quite, I mean, nicely for us. We were very happy with what, with the audience that we were able to gain through that. Um, and I think the key to influencer marketing is always a balance, right? It's, it's, you can't just rely on that. You have to, I think, use it, um, in conjunction with other initiatives that then sort of give a fuller picture of you as a brand. Um, just that note there, I think maybe for some people listening, they're like, Ooh, what's a micro influencer? So what would you deem a micro? I mean, I know, but what, what you've, you've used them. What, what was your criteria for a micro influencer? So for us, I mean, we've used, um, influencers that had, let's say, an Instagram following of anywhere from like, you know, even five, 7,000 to 30,000 um, followers. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's micro. I'm not sure now, maybe it's probably even because it just keeps going, you know, lower and lower. But, and the reason why we kind of focused on, on, on that level of following is because we found them to have some of the more, more authentic engagements, you know, comments and interactions with, you know, with the content that that influencer put out. And so, you know, we're all about creating a community, you know, creating a brand that wants to be, you know, wants to be a, uh, a resource for women. And, um, and so therefore, it was very important for us, you know, to have the authenticity versus, you know, and the engagement versus just reaching a lot of people, Numbers. you know? Yeah. yeah. What in your experience? So, you know, you've, you've worked through a franchise, you've um, successfully brought that to the UAE, you've exited that, you've set up um, the Gaggler. What are some of the sort of things, if someone were here now was like, right, I'm thinking about setting up a business or I want to grow my, what are some of the tips in your experience that you'd like to share and inspire someone listening going, right, this really helped me or this would really work for you? So, I, I mean, I guess I could share, you know, um, a couple of tips just from different phases of my, I think, my business career. I think the first I would say is like, if you're look, thinking of launching a business, you know, definitely do your research, right? So like when I brought Kidville over from New York to Dubai, I ran the business sort of cookie cutter as per the template, you know, in my manual, if you will. But within, you know, very quickly on and within the first year, I realized, okay, this is not going to quite work. I need to kind of, you know, tweak a few things and cater to, to Dubai, you know, because the expectations here of parents are different from, say, parents in New York. Mm-hmm. So definitely do your research. If there are other businesses like yours, visit them, observe, uh, definitely tap into a lot of the women's groups now, you know, that are out there um, and speak to them. They're network- well, I guess there are fewer networking opportunities now, but there used to be at that time. But definitely this this whole element of research, you know, and then really using that research to really look inside and ask yourself, like, you know, what is it that resonates with me? 
because not everything will and focus on what does because then it'll be a much smoother how can I say a smoother experience mm -hmm. if you folk, if you hone in on kind of okay I like these elements because this speaks to me it speaks to my personality my objectives the kind of what goals I have for myself because if you try and do everything it's not going to end well yeah um so that's that's one tip I think the second I'd say only because I've done this so many times I guess don't be scared to fail you know um failure is scary but don't be afraid to make a mistake or 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 have a failure because whatever you fail that there's just much better stuff on the other side of that is 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 what my experience has been can you share one experience then that you're like i thought that was a failure and then it turned into something way better so i i guess i i would go back to kind of you know my big learning which is after this big investment with kidville and all that and building out I and mean, there's a lot like this capex is the franchise fee etc so you know for a year when i kind of did everything as per the the manual if you will it's a very expensive way of operating. So when I when I made that decision that, okay, I've got to kind of, I mean, there, there was no other decision I had to, right? Because I had to kind of accept that, okay, I made the wrong decision to kind of do everything cookie cutter. Because I, I think similar to what you've said previously, I thought, okay, if I do everything perfectly, the New York way, the American way, people, it might resonate with people here and they'll love it. It'll be a different way of doing business. So it's almost like that mentality of build it and they will come is what I had. And that's a Dubai mentality, I think. You know, well, true. So I kind of, I guess I kind of fell for that, you know, and I thought, well, they don't know what they want. I'm going to knock their socks off with what I, I brought from New York. And, uh, but I had to kind of admit to myself that, okay, that wasn't the best decision. It was an expensive decision, but then I, you know, I had to learn from it. I had to adapt. And it took about a good like six to nine months to really make those changes because there were there were fundamental changes you know being in the education business is not that it's not that easy to just yeah. um, overnight switch switch into something else so it did take me some time but then once that settled then the business did better it catered more to the needs of the families here and it was um, a better journey after that so if you'd continued doing that sort of so, so you, you did the investment and then you realized that wasn't quite right. So you saw that as potentially a failure. Yeah. But actually, it gave you the opportunity to make the business better. And then within nine months, the business was doing way better. Yeah, it started to kind of, yeah, it started to bounce back. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's that, that acknowledgement of, okay, you've made a mistake. That's really critical. Because I mean, honestly, if, if, you, if you sort of stay in denial, then you could continue you know, making that mistake. And that is by far the worst mistake. Yeah. What about your experience with the gaggler? What's something that you thought, oh, that I thought that was a failure, but it set me up actually for success? Uh, so with the gaggler, I would say, you know, when I started the business, I had a business partner that was involved and um, she's now moved on. She's moved, uh, left the UAE and moved um, to, to Europe. But I will say, though, that I've learned from that in that I think it's very important that if you are going to partner with somebody, you know, in a um, entrepreneurial venture, it's very important to really know the um, skill sets of, of, of the person that you're considering to partner with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was a, 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 she, she's a friend of mine um, and, and still is a friend of mine, but friends don't automatically make the best business partners, right? So what, what do I mean by that? Like, I know what my skill sets are. I know what I'm good at. I, I know what I'm, you know, not very good at. So it's, it's important to make sure whoever that business partner is, that they have those skill sets that you don't have, right? So that together, you guys complement each other and then can, you know, obviously run the business more uh, effectively. And I think that's really important. I think people assume, I mean, I did, that, oh, we're friends. It's going to be great. You know, it's going to be fantastic. Like, mm -hmm. let's do it. And I mean, for me, that was very atypical because I mean, I've been in business for God, like 25 years now and I should have known better, I guess, but it's, it's a new venture. You're positive. You've got creativity flowing and you're really you amazing. Know. Yeah, exactly. But, but you really do even because it's business, because you're obviously doing this to make money, sustain a business. You've got to ask those hard questions of, okay, Hey, can you do this and this and this? Cause I can't. And if the answer is, no, I, I, I'm not good at it either. Well, then maybe they're not the best business partner. Mm. I think a lot of people, and I'm not speaking for you, but certainly when I've, again, spoken to clients and, and maybe they're trying to find someone to work with, they often make a role fit around a person or rather than actually finding 
the right person for the role. It's like, oh, this person could sort of do this and could sort of do this because I would actually like to work with them rather than going, I really need, like you say, this particular skill set and this particular personality to make this work. So yeah, don't make the role or the the business fit around that person. Make it work. And the business. Yeah. I mean, and and when I've met people, you know, like at networking, um, you know, events in person or in Zoom or whatever, you know, my advice has always been like, like literally take it like a job interview, you know? So ask, look at their CV or their resume, whatever you call, you know, that piece of paper that says, this is what I've done. You know, look at that because literally if you, if you look at your CV and you look at theirs and you put it together and there's enough sort of gaps filled, then, you know, you've got something, you know, that could be really good. So I, I now tell people like, you know, whether they're a friend or not, like, just take it like a job interview, Mm. interview them, ask them, you know, for their CV, if you will. Yeah. So um, what's next for the Gagra events? We've got a new website coming. What, what, what else is happening? So yeah, the new website is a, is a huge thing because it's actually, it's almost like giving birth to a baby. <laughs> I swear, I feel like I've been doing it for nine months. So that's, that's actually one of the biggest things. I think once that's out, then it's really like focusing on, on uh, expanding our audience. So right now, you know, we have, we are very much UAE focused and um, slowly though, organically, we're having, um, we're seeing a lot of traction come in from Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar and Oman. And I'd like to kind of, expand upon that so that we now then can become like a regional platform, yeah. if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, so really that's the, that's the next focus. And if there's someone um, listening now that they think they've got, you know, great content to share with your audience, you know, how could they get in touch? What's the best way for them to, should they write an article? Should they reach out to you first? Like what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, I definitely say, yeah, absolutely. I definitely say, you know, um, reach out first, you know, it's, 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 uh, probably better than to write something and then reach out. You can email editor at thegaggler.com. You could also visit our website, which is thegaggler.com. We're on Instagram, thegaggler. And then also, if you wanted to, you could join our, uh, Facebook group, which is a private, uh, group for women only. And that's called the Gaggler Middle East group. So, you know, any, any of those avenues, you will reach a Gaggler team member and, um, and we can get a conversation started. Yeah, I think, uh, and that's a, a great, great pl- platform to start on. Something that I've done in the past, and you can maybe see whether that would work is, you know, I've reached out to do collaborations or share content. I've given some titles of potential things that I could write or that would be seen as value. So it's not just a hey, I'm in this industry and I could really offer this. It's like, hey, I'm in this industry and I think your audience would like maybe one of these five titles and, and give a bit of an idea as a starting point. What would you say to, to someone who did that? No, absolutely. I mean, having um, you know ideas that they can pitch, for sure. I mean, it, we want people to write what they're, you know, what, they're, what they're good at or what they know a lot about. And so certainly having somebody give us a list of like five ideas, um, you know, uh, helps us understand, okay, how does this fit within our, mm-hmm. our own editorial calendar? So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So if you've got a parting piece of advice or something that you would love to share with your, you know, your gaggler girl that's listening now, what would you want to say to her? I want to say to her, you're beautiful as you are. And, and there's so much more that you can do. And we're here to help you. Love it. Thank you so much for your time today, Monica. And I look forward to seeing your new baby. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's been a pleasure to be on your show. Lovely. How was your first podcast interview? Really fun. It's not as scary as you think it is. It's not. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for being here and listening to the episode today. Were you inspired? What was one takeaway that really resonated with you? Head over to Instagram. I love to hang out there. Kelly Lundberg official and drop me a DM. Tell me the best part or even better, screen share it, share it with a friend and inspire them too. We are growing weekly and it's all down to you. Thank you so much. Reviewer of the week left this message. 
easy and inspirational listening, Kelly has an infectious style which brightens your day from Luck Scott. Thank you so much. Please keep leaving those ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or following on Spotify. It really does make a massive difference. And remember, be inspired and keep following those dreams.